My name is Dale Hathaway, and some of you may have recognized that I'm not Jane Wilson. Some of you may also recognize me because I have supplied it our Savior in the past, and some of you may not recognize me at all, but I welcome you on behalf of the people of our Savior to this, our morning prayer. Whether you're following along in your prayer book or from the downloaded copy of the bulletin service or just following along in any and all cases, I welcome you on behalf of the people of our Savior. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We pray together the Venite, page 82, or from your bulletin. Together, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Psalm 116 as printed in the bulletin, verse 1, verses 10 to 17. Together. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, 
is now and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Little, let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of, of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind them, behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to her said and said, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. And he said, oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham and Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together the canticle, page 92, the Song of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. A reading from Matthew. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom 
and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, son of Canaan, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wood, wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable, O Lord, in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Welcome to Proper Six, or Second Sunday After Pentecost, variously known around the Anglican Church, the first Sunday of ordinary time. We make a shift today, and so I'm shifting gears myself. I start off with a, uh, a funny story. I don't usually do that. Back in the 70s, there was a comedy team that produced a series of comic albums. Each had the title, Bert and I. Some of you may know them. The setting was the down east part of the country, Maine and thereabouts. There was one story that I have not forgotten, largely because I've retold it from time to time. A visitor is passing through town and stops to ask for directions. He receives a monologue that goes something or went something like this. Well, you go down here a piece and you turn right at that big oak tree there and you go a ways up to the right and then so on. After a series of such directions, the voice says, you know, come to think of it, you can't get there from here. Now, I thought of that story as I reflected on this week's scripture readings and the gospel in particular. The church has really focused on mission. From the, the gear shift of last week, we heard the ending of Matthew's gospel, gospel, Trinity Sunday, the Great Commission, commissioned for ministry. Jesus has gathered his disciples and sends them out into the world to teach in his name and baptize new disciples, and ends with the promise, I will be with you always to the end of the age. And now, this Sunday, we have begun a cycle that shifts from the season of Thanksgiving to Pentecost or Advent to Easter, um, a season controlled by thematic messages, the anticipation, the waiting, the coming of the Messiah, and the manifestation of who he really is, all the way up to his death and resurrection. That whole series feels something like a symphonic piece for me, where the orchestra works through a basic theme. Different instruments, different modulations, and so on, all brought together over the course of an extended time. We've traveled from birth to inauguration of the work of the Messiah, through to his ultimate deliverance. And then the scene we saw last week, Jesus returning to the mountaintop and delivering the Great Commission. Now today, we are back towards the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. In a general way about mission, Jesus' mission, at its beginning in Nazareth. And we will follow that for some months now, Jesus' own ministry. The general lesson for us will be continuing those through those weeks that we should follow in his footsteps, that as we see his ministry, so is our ministry. If we are sent on a mission, it is appropriate that we be commissioned as we were last week. Now I understand that commissioning as being a commission of the whole community. I preached on that last week. We are not to divide ourselves between those who have figured it out and those who don't, between those who are poor and those who are powerful, between those who are despised and those who have millions of followers on Twitter. And so that gets me back around to where I started with a story that asks the question, where are we going and how do we get there? What is the route to get to where we're going on this mission of ministry. All along, century upon century, we have thought we knew where we were going, in a general way anyway. 
that great commissioning and the ministry we attend to and sending missionaries out, it explained in our minds how it was that a ragtag group of Jesus followers turned into a world religion, the largest in the world today. We just understood that that great commission was about spreading the word of Christ as understood by those who were spreading it now, to those who hadn't heard or who didn't understand the word the way we understood it. It was a basis for colonizing the new world, ultimately motivation for sending missionaries to Africa. And it's the motivation that drives most of our churches, maybe all of them, year by year, a focus on numbers, Success measured by growth, reach the unchurched, convert the barbarians. But I wonder, along with Bert and I, what is the destination? What if we couldn't get to our destination by the route we had chosen? And then at that point, I bring Abraham into my reflections. I think about our first reading. I wonder if it can give us a clue about how we should be going about our mission for which we have been commissioned. The Genesis reading is about a person and a time almost as far removed from Jesus' time as ours is from Jesus, Abraham. He had been visited by three strangers, aliens, some folks not from around here, and they had a strange promise from God to pass on to Abraham and Sarah. So strange that they couldn't really wrap their minds around it. They couldn't take it seriously. Sarah laughed. But Abraham opened himself to that promise because he welcomed those strangers into his tent. He offered them hospitality, though he had no idea what it was all about. He just knew that that's what he had to do. The promise from God delivered by those three strangers was that Abraham and Sarah would have a son, and through them their offspring would be as numerous as the stars in the sky, the grains of sand on the beach. I guess that's maybe in part where we get that notion of our commission to increase our numbers. My first important lesson about Middle Eastern hospitality came from my Old Testament professor in seminary. His name was Joseph Hunt. I think of him as a, as a saint, a great saint, but I won't make this about him at the moment. In his earlier life, he had lived and traveled among the Bedouin in the Middle East. And when he told stories about the power, the depth, the importance, the vitality of hospitality as it was practiced there, we just believed him. Hospitality was a quality of life there which very often meant the difference between life and death. Hospitality was more important than family feuds and war and peace between tribes and nations. I learned about a similar approach to hospitality from a priest friend of mine who thought that Wyoming was heaven on earth. Now, there are some things about Wyoming that are pretty amazing, but then this is not about Wyoming. But the people you may know, the people of Wyoming are proverbial, uh, it's a hard word to say, proverbially fiercely independent. They go their own way. Don't treat fools kindly. Their nearest neighbor may live 20 or 30 miles away. But there is a kind of fierce hospitality to be found in Wyoming, and I have experienced it because the people there know that at any moment their life may depend on that neighbor. So Abraham offered hospitality to three strangers because he knew that it might well be strangers who would deliver the promise of God that would tell him where he was supposed to go and how he was supposed to get there. I believe that God is like someone who would offer homemade chicken pot pie to a stranger. Ha, now I got you. I don't know if you love chicken pot pie the way I do. It may sound a little strange, 
But the thought that God would be at work in front of an oven and a stove preparing a kind of meal for ordinary sorts of people, that just makes perfect sense to me. I at least have liked chicken pot pie since I was a youth, but I've only just learned in the past year <laughs> that my wife makes the best chicken pot pie in the world. And she shared it last week with a virtual stranger. In heaven, God serves people chicken pot pie, I'm sure of it. And he does so to strangers. Jesus sent the 12 out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said, go into the houses you meet, and if they offer hospitality, let God's promise shine within it. If they don't offer hospitality, well, just go on. He commissioned them, us, to pass on the good news, the gospel, so that God's grace is at hand and anyone witnessing wouldn't want to miss it. The Great Commission, as I hear it, is not about numbers. It's not about dollars. It's not about members. It's not about balance sheets of some sort or another. It's not about being the biggest and the best. It's about recognizing that in three strangers from a foreign land may come the best news you will ever get in your life. It's about embracing a promise that seems far-fetched and beyond anything but maybe laughter, because it might well be God talking to us. And getting to our destination may well be a little bit like preparing chicken pot pie. These past couple of weeks, our country has entered a kind of George Floyd moment. Folks that I know have either been unable to turn their eyes away from the news or have been so overwhelmed that they've turned the news off. We have been commissioned, we, the church, have a mission to our own country. Abraham's radical hospitality can give us a clue about how to go about that. He knew that it was in what seemed outlandish and strange that God's promise was to be found. So we read in the New Testament, don't neglect to open up your homes to guests because by doing so, some have been hosts to angels without knowing it. Abraham received the word of God through the strangers. Jesus' disciples received it directly from Jesus. But in both cases, the mission was to go out to make it known that God's work of grace was always at work for healing, for reconciling, for justice among the people. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. One of the preachers this past week said that though we struggle and travail, God will prevail. And he said, the reason he knows that is he'd read the end of the story. The lion and the lamb lie down together. That's Isaiah. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. That's Jesus. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? That's God to Abraham. I have heard the message clearly these past few weeks. The destination toward which we travel is clear enough. It is to rest in the hospitality of God. And I think of it as accompanied by chicken pot pie. There may be pain and suffering along the way, but we need one another for the journey. All of us count. None of us has all the answers. The routes we've taken in the past didn't work. They were not going to get us to the destination to which we've been called. And the profoundly good news is that God will get us there in the end. And our song is, Hallelujah Anyhow.
So if we were all together here, I would say, let us stand and pray together the Apostles' Creed. You don't have to stand. You can be wherever you are. But together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving help on all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion for the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A tradition in seminary was that the prayer for mission was repeated by everybody in the, at the, at the prayer in the chapel at the time. It was a way of underscoring that all of us are called to mission in one shape or frame or another. But um, I invite you to, to say along with me the prayer of mission, but in any case to accept that call to mission to which all of us are called. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross. 
that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. And now I invite your prayers. Um, all of you may unmute yourselves as you speak and offer a prayer out loud um, in your hearts or silently. We'll take a time now to listen to each other. We remember those on our parish prayer list, Allison Taylor, Mike Murray, Jim Clower, Mike Taylor, Marshall Rouse, Shirley, Amy Thames, those in the military, Fidel Byrd, Cameron Thomas, those who have died, Charlie Pendleton, Ernie Bordeaux, now I invite Phil to offer us announcements for the week. Good morning. My name is Phil Oakey and I'm a member of your vestry and I'm happy to share some announcements with you today. The Reverend, excuse me, this morning, we would like to welcome the Reverend Dale Hathaway as our priest, guest priest, and officiant. Dale is a familiar face to us, and we look forward to having us, having him with us while Janie is away. As usual, you will find a lot of important information in the ECORN. I'd like to draw your attention to the St. Junia's Guild meeting on Wednesday, June the 17th at 6 p.m. This will be a Zoom meeting, and to sign up, you will need to contact Tammy Wendell. Please check the eCorn to get her email address. All women of the church are welcome. Remember that whether we gather in person or virtually, our mission is to celebrate Christ, serve Christ, and share Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
Let us pray together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. to stay with us for a time of fellowship in the meeting rooms that I think happens automatically at this time. <laughs>